Nietzsche. I'm going to start with you. So there's this beautiful place in the film where you're describing your seminal moment of awakening and healing when you talk about being in another space and recognizing yourself as pure love and dropping the fear, and then you come back, you make a choice to come back. Am I getting that right? Yeah. And so then you're back. Where's the fear? <laughs> do you confront the fear now? When it comes up, if it comes up, what, what do you do with it? What's your way of working with that question? Yeah. So the, the fear in the way that I used to have it before, I, would, I was fearful all the time. I used to make every decision from a place of fear. Like basically, every decision you make in life, whether it's, um, you know, whatever it is, whether it's to take a job, whether it's to get married, every decision is made from a place of either fear or love. Like, do you make the decision because you love the decision, you love the person, you love the job, you're passionate about the work, or are you making that decision because you fear that if you don't do this, something bad is gonna happen? That if you don't marry right now, uh, your biological clock is going to run out, or no one better is gonna come, come your way, or if you don't take this job, you're not gonna find a better one, and you're not gonna make enough money. So. I had made every important decision in my life up to that point of getting diagnosed with cancer from a place of fear and not from a place of love. And I want to say here that I used to eat extremely healthy food, extremely healthy. I juiced, I, I used to have organic wheatgrass, um, I was vegan, but it was because I wanted to do everything I could to avoid cancer not because I loved my life and because I wanted to live long and I wanted to be healthy. So those are the wrong reasons to be obsessive about eating healthy foods. It's the fear of cancer. I watched two people die of cancer and that exacerbated my fear and made me even more health conscious. But actually, that's not health conscious, that's illness conscious. What we have labeled as being health conscious and what we label as our healthcare system is actually an illness scare system. So it's ironic that even our hospitals, I hated hospitals because I used to feel fearful in them. So it's ironic even the places for healing also make you feel fearful, which suppresses your immune system. So anyway, I lived my whole life from a place of fear. Um, that fear is gone after the near-death experience, completely gone. And that doesn't mean to say that I never feel fearful, but it's a very different kind of fear today. When I feel a little bit of fear, it's not about illness, it's not about failing, it's not about being good enough. It's sometimes when something happens that's unexpected, then there's a fear, but then the next thing I do is I let go. I've realized from that experience that one of the things that causes fear is this belief that we, we believe that we are in control of the situation. And when the situation is out of control, we feel helpless, we can't do anything about it, and so we feel fear. It's like with illness, when we believe that illness, that we're victims of illness, that illness happens to us, then we feel fear because we feel am I gonna be the next one? One in three people are gonna get cancer. We listen to all these statistics and we feel fear. But when you realize that you're not in charge, at least not your brain, not your physical self, there's something higher, something greater, and that's what I discovered in the other realm. I discovered <clears throat> that who I am is something much, much more <coughs> than this physical body. We all are. We're all something much more powerful. And we're much more powerful, we are complete, we are whole, but we don't realize it. And we live in this life, in this physical body, believing that we constantly have to work at improving ourselves. And when things don't go the way we want it to, we feel fear and we beat ourselves up and we say, what am I doing wrong? I don't do that anymore. When something goes wrong, I kind of go, okay, so what do you want me to do next? You sent me back, <laughs> now what? <laughs> so, and so it is, it is a matter of realizing that you are an expression of pure consciousness. 
of pure love, of pure God, call it whatever you want. We're all different religions, different ethnicities. To me, it doesn't matter what you call it, but we are all expressions of this pure essence. And the more we chase after, or the more we feel we need to improve and work on ourselves, the more we're sending ourselves the message that, we are, that there's something wrong with us. But there isn't. The problem is our belief that there's something wrong with us not the fact that there's something is wrong with us. So that, so that fear has completely disappeared. Um, and when you live a life that is your own life and not a life that where you are reacting to external fears, where you are trying to be what everyone else wants you to be, when you live a life that is your own life, being who you are, then you attract what is truly yours. And then whatever fears you come up with aren't really fears. They're just challenges to take you to the next level of who you are. So that's the difference. <laughs> Our only responsibility is to heal ourselves. That's all. And even the people who are, it's not just the people who are breathing in the pollution or eating the toxic. It's also the people who are creating the, the toxic environment. If they healed themselves, they would, they would put well-being above profits. It's, it's because so many people put profits above well-being that we have this situation. But if we thought about it this way, imagine if our only currency was energy. We think in terms of currency as being money. We think in terms of currency as being, um, like we think in terms of success as being how much money we make and how much money we accumulate. But imagine if we had a paradigm where everybody, every single person thought of currency as energy. And we thought, in, so in other words, the best thing we can do is create more energy for ourselves. And when we have more energy, we have more energy to share with everyone. So if everything we did was to maximize energy as opposed to maximize profits, we'd have a very different world. And we would see the world differently if each of us healed our own self. And I mean, I love this question because this is really my realm. Um, when you say, how do we stay in a higher consciousness, to me the problem's in the question. And maybe some people will get what I'm talking about, which is you're implying you're not. Do you get this? Like, think about it this way, it's a very simple metaphor. When people go to the gym, you know, people are like, dude, how do you have a six pack, right? I'm like, because I'm human and it's part of your anatomy. <laughs> you don't have one because you've got a bunch of shit in the way of yours. <laughs> right, does that make sense? So, I'll let everyone just get that. <laughs> people are going to the gym to try and get a six pack, right? I, I tell them, stop doing the stuff that's hiding the six pack you already have. Right? So to your point, I would assert that how do I stay at that higher level of consciousness is to recognize that's who I am. If you're trying to get there, you're implying that your, your human form, which is not wrong, I mean, I, I take care of my human form, but it would be a misidentification. And then things like LA become a problem because you compare yourself to other humans. Does that make sense? I mean, it's a bit of a deeper philosophical point, but it's... It's a misassociation with your, your human form and your mind and your body as opposed to your true essence. So similar to what Nita was saying, recognizing we are consciousness or we are love, which all sounds very esoteric and philosophical, but really to truly get that. Like you're, you're not your name, you're not your nationality, you're not your weight, you're not your height. That would be, that'd be like me sitting in my car and saying, I'm a Range Rover. It doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, it helps me to get around just like this vehicle does, but it's not who I am. Anita, did you want to add to that? Yeah, in fact, um, it's very similar. What I was thinking was also very similar to what you just said. And, uh, and it is that when, when something, it's not that we never have our down times, but when something does make me feel a little bit down, I don't think in terms of what do I need to do or what do I need to learn or what's missing, what do I need to add. It's more like 
I know I already am, and exactly what Peter said, that the, the problem with the question is that how, how do you elevate your consciousness to be like other people? You already are there, but what is preventing you from feeling that now? So that is the question I would ask myself, is what is preventing me from feeling that now? What is preventing me from experiencing it now? Or what is preventing me from seeing it now? And an analogy or an example I like to use is something I used earlier today, is that if you remember that uh, when Michelangelo was asked how did he carve out that beautiful statue of an angel out of this block of marble, and his answer was, the angel was already there. I just chipped away at the bits that were not the angel and I set him free. That is what we need to do, is realize that we already are everything that we're trying to attain. And just get rid of the bits that are not you. That's, that's how I would do it. Thank you so much for being here and sharing this with all of us. Thank you to Adam. Thank you all for being here. Give him a good round of applause. Last, last metaphor, which is real simple. If you want to get in shape, you go to the gym, you need to use some kind of resistance to get stronger. If I, if I give my professional athletes two five pound dumbbells and ask them to do bicep curls, they'll look at me like I'm a freaking idiot, right? So likewise in life, consider that if you're gonna get stronger, if you're gonna get more powerful, if you're gonna to evolve to the capacity that you really have, then embrace challenge. <coughs> Don't run away from it. For me, I do meditation and a whole lot of other things. Um, to remain in that state of mind or try to get there at least. Do you need to do that or you're set for life? <laughs> that's a great question. That's, that's that's a great. great question, thank you. Yeah. I don't actually do that because what happens, and this is what I try and do when I speak, when I do my workshops, when I do my um, speeches and particularly my workshops, is what I try and do is I want people to experience the transformation so they don't have to feel that they have to keep working on themselves. Because in truth, you don't need to keep working on yourself. It's your belief that you need to keep working on yourself is what is sending you the message that you are flawed. Does that make sense to you? And that is what I learned when I was in the coma. Because when I was in the coma, I experienced being in the other realm. And I experienced the perfection of who we really are. And who we are is really God manifest, I guess you can say, or pure essence or consciousness manifest. We can call it whatever we want. You know, We can call it God, we can call it what we want. But the point is not about working at being God. It's about realizing you are an expression of God. And I don't know if you, you know this quote from Michelangelo, for example, when he was asked, how did he carve this beautiful art piece, this beautiful angel out of this marble? He said the angel was already there. He just, he just chipped away at the pieces that were not the angel. You already are, you already are. We don't have to work at constantly being because we already are. It's about seeing through or getting rid of what is not you or what is not God. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.